It's November the 23rd, 2024. I'm Chris and this is the Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Why are you laughing? Because <laughs> we're imagining <laughs> the intro. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm back. I've, you know, I, I haven't been here for like how many Couple episodes? Of weeks. Three yeah. episodes or something. So Something like I'm, that, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe it's you. Oh, have you? <laughs> you have to completely retrain me from the from scratch. Well, this is a podcast about the future of photography. Ah, thank Sometimes. You. Sometimes it is. <laughs> Sometimes. I, I hope I hope you held up the fort. Well, I, I'm sure you did. Well, we, we did all right. We did we didn't we, Jeremiah? We were all right. Yeah, I think we uh, we amused we ourselves and uh, we talked about things. So which which is kind of customary here. So today I have prepared an episode because I went, I went through the last couple of weeks of things happening in photography land and I have uh, prepared a news episode. So we have four news items, um, one from the film side of things, one from the legal side of things and two from the how to make money side of things. And then we'll finish this off with a bunch of picks as usual. And um, I think that's how the show goes, right? If I remember correctly. Something Pretty like much. that. Yeah. Something like this. Okay. With, let's, with a lot of segues. That's, that's fine. That's fine. We'll, we'll um, of course, excel in the segues. Um, Kodak. Still around. If you shoot film, you know that. If you don't shoot film, then people... I have this. I have this um, from people who find out I shoot film... I often get this question, but can you still buy film? Really? You know, wow, okay. Yes, still still getting this question. And uh, of course, that's these these people are usually exposed to film, pun not intended, uh, at a drugstore. And nowadays what you get at a drugstore is like, a, I don't know, a couple of rolls of Kodak Gold on the on the shelf. Can I ask you both a question? Kodak Gold is very popular now. It is. It's uh, a good film. If you got film. around where you are, are there camera stores that have an enormous selection of film? Uh, old school, like it used to be. What is a camera store? Um, or how about a photographic supply organization that is retail? That you can walk in and go, oh, look at that. Look at that. We have some here in the UK, but only in cities, only in big cities. So uh there, there's a a, a long established chain of stores in in the uk called snappy snaps uh and that was a place where you would go and get your films done in two hours or, or whatever they, they still exist and some of them will still process film but most of them will sell film um but yeah it's there's there's not that much around um uh, but the, it's, it's all there if you if you know where to go find it but but you don't come across yeah. it every day anymore. Same, same here. Bigger cities like Berlin, of course, uh, will have a, a decent uh, or does have a decent, um, not just a store, but also they, they also make film. And um, so, but Kodak, Kodak, Rochester, New York. Um, and I saw, I saw, the, saw the news that they stopped, they, that they stopped film production. I was like, what? Are they running out of business? Or are they going out of business? Well, it turns out, no. Their CEO um, announced during the their Q3 earnings call that production will pause in November, and it is to modernize their factory, to upgrade okay. production. So they are investing money in making everything I don't know faster, better, leaner, um, they're, they're Possi motion <laughs> possibly cheaper. Um, I'm not sure, but the, the the motion picture and still film uh, sales are increasing. So mm -hmm. that thing, the, the whole film thing, is is booming as we as we frequently noted here in the past. Things are coming back. New cameras are coming on the market. The entire film volume um, seems to be around the seven billion US dollar mark. Can but, I say, is this a mirror of vinyl? <laughs> is it? <laughs> Is it? I don't know. Well, but. vinyl outsold uh, CDs uh, this year for the very first time, uh, which I thought was interesting. And um, we may start to see, uh, you know, film. I, I'm not saying it's going to outsell digital uh, formatting chips, etc. 
But I I feel that there is a kind of return to the the look, the feel, but also the sound. Yep. Uh, sh shutter sounds are are definitely a thing um we had in on, uh, in my german podcast happy shooting we had for years we had a, a a sound um thing at the beginning having people guess what shutter sound that thing was and uh that was i think i think we sh should still have the archive somewhere it's pretty pretty interesting um so yeah film film is, is kodak's central growth area they also grow in chemistry they also grow in in coatings for evs i suppose it has something to do with batteries or something but um they coat things they have they have, they have the material if you, if you know how film is made it is coating they coat um yeah. the plastic with emulsion so they have the technology they have the no anyway they kodak. also do digitization in yes. other words uh, i had um Uh, my mother had sent me boxes and boxes and boxes of, you know, the old film uh, snaps, old movies that were in the basement covering years and years and years. And um, yeah. just to go through it, I just went to Kodak. They sent me an enormous box with, you know, kind of uh, absolutely beautiful um, kind of segmented or uh, ways to organize it. It took me about uh, 20 minutes, put it in the box, sent it up, and um, maybe three weeks later, all the, all digitized. Um, it came back with thumb drives. Uh, you could download it from the net, and they did a beautiful job of it. And that was all Kodak. Yeah. Sound, sounds good. I, mean, I, I tell you what, if they are upgrading their plant and machinery and that then makes it more cost effective and the price of film starts to come back down again, that, that would be awesome. I mean, it's it's let's let's be honest, film is horrendously expensive at the moment. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, so it, it, it's almost it, it's almost a barrier to entry to film photography now, the cost of film, at least for some people. Right. So so if this is if this is a sign that because the global demand has reached a point where people can afford to invest in the manufacturing, that would be awesome. And if you if you go back to that um, the, to the smarter everyday YouTube channel, um, the guy was in the Kodak factory and he made three episodes out of it for of, of film production from start like from making the plastic uh, base out of out of uh, gran granules of plastic uh, to the making to boxing things, but all the production steps in between. You have a you get a pretty good look into the factory and it's. Um, you see a lot of machinery there that hasn't been upgraded in pro possibly not it was necessary <laughs> to upgrade them in in 40 years 50 years but um yeah i could imagine some of that maybe getting uh yeah. some makeover i i doubt if it's going to bring down the cost of film very very few items have decreased in prices over the last decade. So, and certainly if you're arguing, if you're making a film and uh, are arguing with a major studio about shooting it on film, you would have to have several billion dollars of earnings in your back pocket as a director before you can enforce that. Um, it's really swapped around. It used to be no shoot film. We don't want to deal with the digital files, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's completely reversed. Um, and I, I feel that they're not archiving all the kind of short ends, what we used to say, or outtakes right. the way they used to be. Uh, now uh, an archive would be creating an interneg from the file itself. But uh, yeah, shooting film uh, for movies is the purview of a, a few directors, um, Christopher Nolan most notably. Um, and it's, you know, it's a wonderful thing. And of course they release it on IMAX if they get to shoot it in IMAX and we have an IMAX theater. Oh, that's many a lot of, of surface. That's huge, big. A lot big of surface, big large film. format and, and a, a pretty impressive projection. Um, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that more film and different kinds of film Uh, will be um, available in the market. I, again, here in Los Angeles, we're very, very uh, lucky. In fact, uh, I think we did a, 
um, a podcast on uh, the kind of ICC profiling and those kinds of kind of customizing for printer software. And I had given a shout out to Freestyle uh, here in Hollywood. And, and they, you know, you walk in, they have basically, it's a, it's a shop for any alternative processes and it's it's just a a complete um candy store for anyone interested in the kind of realm of photography and from massive refrigerators of every kind of film that is available now um to kind of obscure chemistries for very very specialized pieces but it's it's a very fun place to go to and of course they do Good stuff outward. I, I think I think it it's um it's important to repeat shooting film makes you more creative and it makes you more happy. And that's scientific <laughs> no scientific, it's a scientific fact. It's science <laughs> it's a scientific fact. I can dig up studies about that. I, anyway, I can um, I can understand that, by the way. Yes. In, in other words, when you don't see your picture right away, the anticipation, the care that you Oh, there, there's 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 a there's hundred a hundred yeah, reasons why yeah. why that is uh, so true. Anyway, mm -hmm. next news item. Um, that's a short one. I found it notable um, or noteworthy. Uh, Canon and Amazon together have uh, won a lawsuit against counterfeit batteries and charger um, makers, um, which is interesting because it's not it's not third party batteries. Like you you have one of these. Canon cameras, you know the battery, the size, the shape, um, the LP, what is it, LPEN uh, types of batteries, and uh, <clears throat> the the there's there's plenty of third party batteries out there, and uh, those are fine. And I have <laughs> after 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 some experiences, let's put it that way, I've switched to the originals, um, which have never let me down. So I'm I'm, I'm a fan of the Canon genuine Canon batteries, but there are counterfeiters who sell you and you have for years sold you batteries, especially on Amazon, that look like the original, that behave like the original, or mostly, and that um, that claim to be original, but then, of course, you, you're you not getting the real thing. And that has been going on for years, and now they have uh, together uh, won a sure. lawsuit. Well, so. by, by the way, have you noticed, sometimes you go to buy a battery on Amazon, or in my case, sidebar, printer ink for a specific <laughs> brother printer. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you search in, you know, uh, Epson, you know, or Canon specific inks for a specific printer. It comes up quickly. You don't read the fine print. You order it. And then when it arrives, yeah. It looks similar, but it's not exactly what you recall as the original. And uh, that happened to me for the very first time on a brother, you know, just my my uh, kind of daily, you know, copy text uh, laser printer. And uh, I opened it up and I was like, I'm, I'm kind of pulling it apart. And what is this? <laughs> and I pulled the wrong thing and black powder. Oh, okay. It was like a magic trick all over me, <laughs> and my, you know. And uh, I realized, oh, these are not canon. I had to scoop. Oh, it's a long story, boring. But but I am telling you that the, the the obfuscation office often on online services. So like, my my, my okay. question is: Has any of you ever fallen to 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 buying fake? real batteries it's never happened to me and i think the last canon batteries i bought must must be several years ago maybe that was before these uh counterfeit ones came on the market no. ink yes batteries no uh, ink i guess the, I, I i was i was surprised that batteries are a counterfeit item because they they're complicated to manufacture i, I don't i don't understand that is that such a high price item that is really worth, or such a high margin item that it's worth counterfeiting that? I, I can understand I for printing because because that stuff is like expensive as gold. Yeah, I think no, these I think things come are. from China, right? Uh, from these uh, you know real life, pretty big factories um, that may even manufacture the Canon 
batteries, but have a sidebar to kind of cut costs and and materials and kind of shave off stuff and, and resell them. I don't know. I'm speculating, but mm. but uh, I remember uh, the last time I was in China, there was a story about um, a factory worker who uh, was, quote, busted. This is a lot of uh, American um, pressure on China to give up these kinds of uh, fake branded items. And uh, the factory owner was tried and convicted and sentenced. Uh, he had a fine of $500. <laughs> <laughs> that is going to ruin him. So, yeah. Uh, I think, I think so anywhere where there's a price differential, right, between the, the, the official and, and, the, and the legitimate third party you know, product, there, there's, there's room for this kind of thing, isn't there? So, yeah, and, and it's not just Canon. Any any brand, oh, yeah, uh, sure. uh, you know, is get it's going to pay. You're going to pay more for the properly branded batteries than you are for of the equivalent are, yeah. third party ones. Which um, yeah. uh, so 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 there's a middle ground. There's a big yeah, there's a big discrepancy. So anybody that says okay, oh, I can I can I can buy the manufacturer's one, and they're only a little bit cheaper than the third party. Uh, sorry, a little bit more expensive than the third party ones. Yeah, so you actually make more money selling the counterfeits than you would third party ones because you can sell rubbish for more than the third party ones would cost so also i think i think one of the main uh questions is uh f for those of us who who do buy these branded items uh what are, what are the margins are, are they overcharging us for these things for the brand value um or not i mean i i think that's it i know if i need a new leica battery i'm I'm paying through the roof. Is the technology any different? No, I don't think so. But value value isn't defined by the product. It's defined by what the customer is is ready to pay, right? Ding, ding, ding. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. Okay, moving on. Um, last two news items both have to do with making money. And uh, I was... Um, let me bring up the first one. And I've, I initially thought that that was the same type of story, but I think it's not. So um, Pentax is uh, is selling software upgrades, like features, which um, I think other camera manufacturers have done that in the past. Um, so it's probably not a new thing. What we're specifically talking about here is an ND grant simulation. So Pentax... Um, Certain Pentax cameras can can do this if you give them money for it. It's uh, some software, some I don't even know exactly how they do it, but um, it it does the, the the bringing down the exposure in the sky kind of thing, possibly through like multiple exposures and some some uh, compositing magic. But um, that ND grad simulation and an Astro Assist feature for like the K1 and the K1 Mark II and the K3 and some some others. Um, you can buy that upgrade for 80 euros. Oh, my God. That's not cheap, right? So That is, uh, considering that most basic film software offers this just as part of their normal package. Um, I mean, you know. Andy Grad simulation, I haven't seen that in other cameras, so not sure and the astro assist i think pentax has a has a bit of a unique feature there i've 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 played with it years ago when it came out fresh on i think the k1 which uses like the gps on board of the camera to to um allow you to 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 take like several minutes of exposure of the night sky by 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 slowly moving the sensor yeah. um which is normally for yeah to to take out image like like shake but um they use I mean, that so it is very special but still it wasn't something you had to pay for in the past well all. you know how do you feel about this you know you buy a camera it comes with your software and there's quote in-app purchases available i mean come on i mean the thing uh, is the, the thing is <clears throat> we have this in in software on on smartphones now in-app purchases you buy yeah. it but you expect it right it's something that um is kind of expected that uh, car manufacturers some of them will sell you a feature that has the hardware already on board and then you need to unlock it um, shout out to tesla here <laughs> not yeah, just yeah. not just tesla there's there's bmw there's B others bmw got into that. trouble didn't they a few years ago in in the market and uh because they tried to sell uh was it heated seats as a as a paid upgrade 
um yeah and it, of course the cars already had all the hardware in them because otherwise it wouldn't work would it right um and they they got into a lot of trouble or was it a subscription you had to pay for heated seats or something like that i think i, I i'm i'm torn on this one right so because it is it's, uh, it is the expectation. It is the market expectation, isn't it? So I think the Olympus cameras, some Olympus cameras or OM system cameras, the, the more modern ones have what they call a live ND function. Um, whether that's an ND grad or not, I'm not sure. Um, but but yeah, it's software enabled, certainly. I um, think this is going to lead to, to a diminished um, normal package when you buy uh, a camera. In other words, it will give you the, quote, basics, and then they will try and get you on a subscription service to upgrade your software constantly for newest features rather than delivering a robust feature set. Now, I'm not theoretically against that in terms of would they develop something sophisticated and really devote uh, a tremendous amount of uh, R&D into doing things that are quite amazing in camera. We've certainly talked about it enough in terms of seeing what's available or what could be available potentially in a camera operating system to really give you some amazing stuff. But at 80, you know, dollars, pounds, uh, Deutschmarks, whatever it is, I, I think that that is an exploitation. Now, if it was like, oh yeah, for five bucks you can get this, or for ten you can get this, or if you pay us so, thirty, so it's a the year, price point. That's that's where you're, uh, I, you're I th hung up on, well, right? The price point relative to the R and D that you're receiving. So if you have a, if you bought a robust operating system that had full features relatively to what we expect today. And there was a dazzling feature that completely transformed the operating system. The quality uh, doubled up in terms of, you know, you, you take a 45 megapixel shot and this thing would kind of simulate 300. And you know what I mean? It would really transform the image. And would you pay for that if they had spent hundreds of thousands or more on developing that? Then you go, well, that's, that's worth it. Uh, if you're in the market for this kind of thing. But as a normal process for photography, given the amount of sophisticated editing systems we have from, you know, from almost free to feels free to expensive like Photoshop, uh, I just feel it's a little bit of an exploitation. I, I think there's a variable missing from your argument, Jeremiah, I'm afraid. Sorry, I'm going to have to contradict you. And it's the number of people that purchase it. Because the R and D, it's, it's so what you're describing there is effectively the the you know, the R and D per unit sale, isn't it? Right, and, yeah. and actually, the 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 amount of that, yeah, the the amount per unit sale goes down. The cost of the R and D per unit goes down depending on how, the volume of your sales. So I remember, I think there was a few years ago, Panasonic brought out a camera. It was one of their you know, video hybrid cameras, like a GH6 or something like that. And they had a, a, a codex as a paid upgrade or something like that. A video codex, the, for the, the pro codex were extra or something like that. And yeah, so that's got a very narrow user base potentially, hasn't it? So, you know, even if they've spent a lot of money, uh, you're still even if they haven't spent a lot of money, sorry, because it's aimed at a niche market, it's still the unit cost for the R and D is going to be quite high. So, well, that, no, we agree. It, Listen, we can agree on we can agree on this, uh, but but the fact of the matter is, my uh, initial argument was that I believe the camera manufacturers will decrease the robustness of their offering initially in order to get you to buy upgrades which are somewhat useful, like an ND grad, which you can do, A, you could buy an ND grad, two, you could simulate an ND grad afterwards. But if you wanted an ND grad in camera, do you have to spend that amount of money? I mean, can, can we spin this a little bit? Because this is interesting, right? Chris, I, I, I'm not going to let you get <laughs> on to the next topic, Chris, because this, this is... No, no, not, no, not no, the next no, topic. No, I have it. something to contribute to this one. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, well, do you, do you want to go first then or shall I? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it, also, it also has to be um, 
in some way coming down to production and and um, let's say making it more streamlined. I remember back in like the must be the nineties or something. Um, I had a VCR that was and kids. That's the tape based video recording device that no one knows about anymore but um that vcr had the same feature set as the bigger vcr the more expensive one but the way they segmented that out was that um they only made these additional features available through the the remote control so if you bought the remote control of the more expensive machine you had the more expensive machine but um that that leaked out somehow people found out and then they all bought the cheap one with the more expensive remote control. So um, the same, the same with car seats that have the hardware in for heating, and you you build that. It's probably cheaper to build every car seat exactly the same. That is just much more streamlined. And um, I think if this is really the beginning of something, um, which I hope it's not, we'll see really, really bad things in terms of the what's it called the enchitification of uh, of services <laughs> yeah, that's a good enough word for me it's a term it's a term and yeah it's um, kind of what i'm, I'm thinking too. i'm thinking of i'm thinking of dark patterns as in um, shutter sound packs but you have <laughs> to pay to turn off the sounds they're all annoying and if you oh. want good sounding ones or if you want to be able to shoot in silence then you can either take your take your tweezers and pull out the cables from the from the speaker or you can pay. That's Ooh, the kind of nice. stuff that I'm afraid of, right? Me too. So this is really, it's really interesting to me because, so, so let, here's a thought experiment, right? So uh, you can go to any used camera store, right? Um, uh, and we all have our favorites uh, and buy uh, a camera, good as new, couple of generations old and, it, it, you can do whatever you want with it, right? There, there are very few new camera models that really, really drive you to upgrade. Not, not if you're being, you know, true to, truly honest and saying, I, "Can I do what I want to do with the camera I've got, or do I need the new one?" Right? Which is, yeah. so there are very few upgrades that actually require you buy that. So, if you extrapolate from that, then we've we're, we're past peak camera right so you've got these big companies you know heavily invested um, and they desperately need us to buy more cameras so if not if we're not going to buy more hardware because the hardware is so good it can last for a decade a bit like you know having a film camera or whatever you uh, then what if uh yeah what are that what is what are their options for a business model to keep going and and you know it's like it's happened especially in, the software in times business. especially in times when camera sales have plunged really yeah exactly that so, so i mean yeah we've all been through this horrible period the last five years where all the major software manufacturers are switching to a subscription model everybody hates it but we haven't really got a lot of control over the matter mostly you know then yeah, if people stop buying new cameras because they just don't need new cameras uh, and they can get really, really good ones on the used market, then something's got to happen to the business model for the camera manufacturers, right? So are we looking at the future of camera business models? Well, yes, yes. Um, Perhaps the problem is that the, the camera's stock price is very um, influenced by its growth rather than by its quality. And it needs to grow. If it's just flat, it is punished. Even though it be making phenomenal hardware or hardware software systems, it's punished if it's not growing. So they're going, how can we achieve the perception of growth? How can we create an illusion of growth even to, mm-hmm. to keep our stock price high? Now, if, if, If they were actually doing things, for example, like Canon, you know, oh, our our camera bodies last a long time. How can we get people to buy a new camera? Well, I would argue, make a better camera, make a more efficient camera, make better lenses, integrate better software. Um, Invent a new mount. Oh, wait, they've already done that. (laughs) Innovate, (laughs) innovate. Innovation will get you there. The reverse of that is we'll hook you on these little micro payments that will achieve in the short term what we want until a third party manufacturer, 
I bring in a company like Red at the time, go back 10 or 15 years, who will come in and completely level the ground and overtake everybody. So you have to build in your own um, market disintegration in order to be a robust company. In other words, you have to be the startup that will displace you even within the company. And yeah. that's my yeah, counter Yeah, that's working really well for like the car industry right now. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm well, sure I that the so <laughs> and got, it worked really well for Kodak as well. So I've got two or three examples, though. One is from the car industry, right? So so the, the what one is, for, let, let's go with the photo industry one first. So DJI are doing quite well. They've got some pretty disruptive products. Yep. Um, and mm -hmm. they've also bought Hasselblad. Um, so they've got, you know, a top of the line established camera manufacturer as well. Um, so so, so that's, that's interesting and disruptive yep. in industry. So there's mm -hmm. a good positive example as far as I'm yep. concerned. Mm -hmm. car, the car industry is, in the auto industry, a really interesting one. So cars are really expensive now. And I don't know if this is the same in your countries, but in the UK, if you want a new car, you don't really go buy a car. What you do is you go, da you go down to the dealership, you put down a couple of thousand pounds and you sign a three or four year finance agreement. You pay a certain amount per month and then you and and then the the value that you pay for month though is not 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 based on paying for the whole car it's based on paying for the delta between the ticket price today and the expected residual price at the end of your your, your agreement yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and so you buy a sixty thousand pound car expecting only ever to pay twenty thousand pounds for it right or something or yeah, something like that a bit more than that probably but and that's how camera manufacturers have managed to get people to continue in this country at least to buy new cars every three or four years or so uh, and it doesn't matter what the ticket price is and the and they get to sell the same car twice you build a car once you sell it twice because it comes back to you at the end of that lease and you sell it as an approved used car and you make another profit margin on it and you make the profit margin on the finance because the financing is all locked into the manufacturers you buy you buy a vw you buy it using vw finance agreements right so so you're actually making three profit margins on the same product so the the how you do that with cameras i don't know i don't think i really want to be you know needlessly upgrading a camera every couple of years because i've paid for half of it on a cars, you know, on cars a are more cars are more more status items more fashion uh, statements than cameras are i guess and this is what what drives a lot of that. You want to be the guy with the new car because it's the shiny, fancy new thing, right? You know, I'd argue that there's probably some of that in photographers as well. It's quite a lot of photographers have cameras that are, you know, I've way, never met one of I'm these. Probably never, one of them. never. Cameras that are way beyond them, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. we're trying not. I'm trying not to refer to you, Jeremiah. I'm just like thinking of other photographers, <laughs> well, right? I'm, just like... I, I'm looking around to see who you're talking <laughs> yeah, yeah. about. Wish that squirrel <clears throat> behind you on the table, mate. That's the one that buys all of those Likers that are sitting in your yeah. in your studio. Right? <laughs> <laughs> <It's just> like... <laughs> Mind you, maybe squirrel autofocus is a feature you'd be prepared to pay for, Jeremiah. I don't know. <laughs> Squirrel, re <laughs> squirrel eye recognition. How about that? I All right, eye recognition. Shall yeah, we? Shall we move on to the <laughs> um, next one? Which again, I thought was was along the same lines. We're talking about uh, Fujifilm, and they have a camera that they um, sell in Japan and uh, in other places. The XM5, um, and when it was released in Japan, it only came with Japanese and English. Wow. Okay. And if you if you wanted, I don't know, German, Spanish, French on it, the language pack, you had to pay not just had to pay a thirty five dollar language edition service, but you had to bring the camera in or send it into the Fujifilm Repair Service Center. <laughs> that's that that that's uh, pretty astonishing. Uh, that that's pretty astonishing, really. It's and 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 again, I thought, oh, that's price gouging. They're they're trying to make more money on that thing. Um, but then the discussions around this, I th made it quite obvious to me that that's not necessarily what it is. Um, it's market protection. What we're looking at is, and I th I think I I think that's correct. When what we're looking at is. Um, the those cameras are much cheaper when you buy them in Japan, and um, if you are in, I don't know France, for example, and you can find a way to do uh, imports around 
something and you need the French language if you want to sell this in France, you can't have it. There is no French language on it. So you will need uh, at least uh, give them an, an additional $35 and send the camera off to be patched in some way. Or would would they if they want if there was an order for say twenty thousand of these cameras in France? Oh, of course. Would then, they then. they would make a bulk order and pay, say, a discounted of thirty dollars per hundred thousand. But 000. it still makes the camera more expensive in France, of course. No question. So. And of course, every market, all the markets are are different in terms of what they are ready to pay, what they what they what they want to pay, and of course, they need to maximize or they want to maximize their profits. So, they are um, segmenting things out this way. I found so, this quite interesting. So the Sounds EU will like be after them on an dub- antitrust <laughs> thing now. Then, uh, possibly. <laughs> Sounds like do you want a dubbed version or the original version of a film going I, out? I to believe a specific I believe market? it's not a it's not a not a rare thing. I think that I mean c- companies selling th- the same thing in different markets for different prices has been around forever. If sure. you if you look back at um, let's say Adobe for example, when before they had the Creative Cloud and everything went to subscription, they sold their Creative Suite in Germany for about twice the price that you that you would pay in the states. Wow. Okay. Double the price. So that was that was that ha- that has that has that has um deeply planted the seed of I don't like them in me um back then um cuz why should I pay for a software product for a and that there was there's no cost in manufacturing an additional copy of that. And they took twice the amount of that's, money that's crazy isn't it they, they, we've yeah. had a few of these over the years in the uk um uh they, we have a, a long tradition here in the uk of a thing we call the booze cruise uh, which is where you drive down to the south coast you get on a ferry and you go to france for the day yep. with a van and you buy loads and loads of booze from supermarkets and come back in your van and and you've saved a fortune uh they they do um uh, the the revenue that they they do uh, uh, revenue and customs they do reserve the right to stop you and pour and, and pour all your booze down the drain if you can't prove it's for personal use. Um, uh, but there was that and the other one back to the automotive industry. I'm afraid um, there was a time when to buy a right hand drive car because of course we need right hand drive cars here in the UK. Uh, it was cheaper to go over to Europe and order it from Europe as a, as a special order really? and then drive it back to the UK. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, um, and then we were still in the EU in those days so i think uh the eu then said no that's not right you have to have pricing sensible pricing for all these things across the whole of the eu so the, yeah there was a there was a few bits and bobs around that that we've had um because we're a little island on the edge of you an enormous union so yeah do they make left-handed cameras with a shutter button on the other side no they don't i, I i'm not aware of it hold it upside down like Jimi hendrix <laughs> <laughs> did did Jimi Hendrix was a photographer, really? Yeah, he held his camera upside down as well because he was left-handed. It was very strange to watch him. Uh, no, left-handed cameras. Not sure about that. But then, but then, the, the, then it goes on because people are right-eyed or left-eyed. It's just well. A so I sort of ask if you could customize a system then, of operations and then shoot with a with a um, uh, with a rangefinder. And your eyes are in the right place. <laughs> yeah, I, I always love it when people review rangefinder cameras. Do you know who? Do, um, or, or rangefinder style cameras. Um, I think Fuji's the the big Fuji Instax cameras are a great example of this. And every all the reviews say, ah, oh, the viewfinder's on the wrong side. It's ridiculous. I can't use it at all. I'm like, I, I'm left eyed. I'm fine. I'm like, yeah, that's the one I want because mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that means I can do that thing that all the rangefinder people talk about about having both eyes open at the same time. Normally, if I'm using a rangefinder, I have both eyes open. One of them's just looking straight at the back of the camera. <laughs> 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 um, it doesn't well, work if- for me. If there are left-eyed cameras out there, um, let you, us know. The list, you, the listeners, let us know. We're on the Discord, tfttf.com slash join TFOP. It's on the screen. It's in the show notes or just find us on the socials. So um, we, We'd love to buy one as long as it doesn't have a software upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would, yeah. I would, I would think. Uh, I mean, you 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 have a, a lot of like um, cameras these days where you have an external viewfinder that you can click yeah. on the top. That would be simple to 
put on the left or on the right. Anyway. Worst, worst kind of price gouging, just to finish on, is that price gouging where you buy a camera and it's got a sensor in it and it's only good for 36 shots and then you have to throw the sensor away and buy a new <laughs> sensor. That's called film. That's called <laughs> film. All right. Um, let's move on. Picks of the week. Um, start with you. Let's, let's, no, we'll, we'll start with Adrian. I'll, I'll <laughs> save mine to the, to the end. Adrian, okay. you brought us... Let me let me share this here. You brought us an important photographic, a really problem. yeah, a photo accessory. Um, it's called men's Chilcat V lace waterproof boots. Yeah, what are we looking at? We are looking at uh, the, these are some boots that I just bought, um, and uh, they are awesome. Right, fashionable. So they well, I don't know that they're fashionable, but they're very yeah, they're 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 very warm and completely waterproof. So they're they're walking boot. They're a walking boot style, a high cut walking boot, but the bottom is completely made of molded rubber, like a pair of wellies, right? So they're properly waterproof. So we're, yeah, and uh, you know, uh, it's a it's a a good old um, adage for photography that you know you need a decent pair of shoes, right? And so if you go, uh, th these are my new photography shoes. They're not actually my photography shoes. They're my dog walking <laughs> shoes. But yeah, no, they're <laughs> <laughs> Same thing, right? Um, I just thought that they just the, the idea of a proper lace up walking boot that is also like really properly waterproof, none of this Gore Tex nonsense. Although I think there might be some Gore Tex in the top half of these boots, um, but just plain old rubber <laughs> that's pretty waterproof. Yeah, it'll also give you like gives your feet no way to breathe. But, um, I mean, in, in general, <laughs> in they've general, been fine you so are, far, they've been fine so far, so in I'm, general, I'm you're perfectly right um i remember several um like landscape photo workshops that i did and uh and uh there's one participant who, who came to several of those and he was always like wrapped up in photo gear and photo protection and like he, he looked like uh, like a weekend warrior kind of person with lots of gear on and uh he had knee pads and stuff and like it, it was it, it felt a bit over the top and um, I asked him and he said, you know what? Um, I can be out here. I can be uh, on my knees taking pictures from low um, from low perspectives. I can be, if it rains, it doesn't matter to me. Um, you guys will be back in the hotel and I'll still be shooting and I'll get the good shots. And he was right pretty much about this. You know what they say? Uh, that there's no bad weather only bad gear yes so yeah yeah absolutely a, a film adage from the set so, <laughs> so um jeremiah you brought us something completely amazing uh this is for those very very few uh lucky enough to have a um apple vision pro or or a any i think any, these work with pretty much any um vr glasses but it is it's called fly and it uses the uh, google earth uh, vr but effectively you are <laughs> you're an you're airplane in a, well no a vtol like one of those things you stand in and you you control it by leaning oh no by really moving forward or backward you could i flew all over la just for fun and hovered over my house and actually you know came down you could you can adjust the height you have uh, an altimeter it, it, and anywhere on earth it is, is it intuitive to to operate intuitive yeah it takes a while just to get used to but it's very very simple and i i thought oh what a great way to do pre-scouting I, uh, I remember um, when I had the, 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 the Quest 1, now Meta Quest, um, back there, Oculus Quest, and it, there, was a, there was something probably still around called Wander, W-A-N-D-E-R, piece of software that would, would use Google Street View, not Google Earth, but Google Street View, and you could hop from, from spot to spot. It was like being inside Google Street View, and you could... Um, yeah. hop to the next spot on a, on a, along a street or something. Funny you say this because the the manufacturers of these same same <clears> one, <throat> same one, and you it, one is like you're on a, I guess some kind of bicycle, but you're standing, ah, and see, okay. and you can move along roads and 
but it's really effective. And of course, it only gets better when your processor is fast, so it rebuilds so, your... So, of um, course, of course, uh, there's a lot of locomotion in there. You move through space, and that is... Um, at least for for some people in VR, that is kind of the thing where they will get de death deathly sick. Is have you have you had any issues? No, like, not that? at all. It's very smooth, and uh, no, okay. I I don't get air sick anyway. So uh, okay. and and you know, it's not like your stomach is moving up and down. <laughs> well, but but, but the sensory but the, input is is there. The, so. the illusion is tremendous. I mean, it is absolutely tremendous. Um, I I. I was in um, Vancouver with my daughter and my granddaughter, and we, we went to some thing where you sit on these benches and it <clears throat> moves off and you fly through, in this case, the Northern Territories and in these uh, valleys and through lakes and whatnot. But you get mist and smell and wind, and the illusion is so dramatic that it really does feel that you are actually in flight. Um, the only miss thing missing here is the wind and the smell, but it is really amazing, and the controls are amazing. And um, again, uh, doing pre-scouts, if you're going to a, a, a place that you're going to shoot from, there's you can actually really circumnavigate the place. You can go, you could probably get another version that goes on Street View I mean, and... I I, I remember um, using some like uh, the the TPE, the photographer's ephemeris, and other tools yeah, to find out sure. where the sun would be at a certain yeah, yeah. time in the future at a certain <clears throat> spot. And these compar comparatively clunky uh, things, um, I think that could, in some way or another, replace that if you can set the time and the get the well, actual um, the actual mm -hmm. celestial bodies in the right places. Did I did I bring this up a, a week or so ago about Google Studio, Adrian? When yeah, we you did, did, we did talk yeah. about that one. Yeah, Google, Google Google Studio has this very specific thing that you mentioned. In other words, I could go to Arc de Triomphe. I could stand there. I could find my place, and I can then say. Six o'clock, sunny day, and it will totally adjust the light to where the most perfect light is through whatever buildings are there. So that's, it is very that's impressive. I just got one slight challenge with it, which is that you're not going to find anything new using one of these things because you, oh. by definition, you're you're constrained by the the places in the world that Google has three D modeled. Sure. Right. So, so I, I when we talked about Google Studio, I was like, "All right, I'll go and have a look down my road then." Right, I'll have a look at my house, and of course, there's no Google 3D out where I live because it's <sighs> not a main city or anything like that. This is like they, they can put they can put a, a flat you know satellite image on a slight angle, and uh, and that's about. I was like, "No, that's not quite how it uh, is." Oh, Adrian, you know, time to move. Time to move. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, just, have you, have the you last seen, place have, I want to live seen, is anywhere that's busy enough to be 3D modeled by Google. <laughs> have you heard of Niantic? Um, the, the, yes. Uh, Pokemon Go why. and, and sure. uh, yeah. Ingress um, kind of things. Um, I think they have just announced something about the, the people who've played that have actually been mapping and... Uh, Oh, that that is that is yeah. now that is now data that is being mined for for um, real world navigation. I, I don't know the details about that, but um, I could imagine something like that ending up becoming uh, a three D mapping device for the entire planet, while people play and don't even know what they're doing. If so. any of you have tried the new um, Flight Simulator twenty five or looked at what's coming i've seen it on <coughs> I've seen some videos uh, on the tools, you know yeah. yeah once you start to kind of integrate the a processing power say of an m5 and the kind of precision of google earth in terms of light and the kind of rendering speed of of um uh, flight simulator and the kind of navigational issues of fly and simulator um it's it's a very very kind of awe inspiring way to explore uh, the world um, to prepare your photography at least in theory for what you want to do and what you want to achieve and where. And then if you're out there in an according landscape and you find yourself like walking 
hiking, maybe with your dog. And <laughs> then the next and last uh, bit of um, bit of um, well, the pick. It's it's actually it's it's more of a for more of a Christmas present suggestion. I think um, I came across that, and I think it's it's brilliant. It's a calendar, of course. New Year's coming up. You need to take that wall calendar and replace it with something new that says 2025. And here is a 2025 calendar that features dogs pooping in beautiful places. <laughs> How about Genius. that? Genius. I, I think it is genius. It is um, full of, well, 12 landscape photos of dogs doing what they do in front of like wonderful mountain ranges and, <laughs> and, uh, and meadows. Definitely and a stocking forests. stuffer. <laughs> That's a stocking stuffer. I mean, why not, right? Um, so um, there's actually, I think, I think it goes back to, uh, to an Instagram a feed called dogs pooping in pretty places and uh it's yeah sort of a photo bombing kind of thing actually actually there's an example here if you watch the video this is i think my favorite example you see a picture of a couple um <laughs> and That's in the cute. background of yeah. uh, the, the dog is literally bombing the photos <laughs> great well what more could you want out of a calendar <laughs> It's humiliating That's, to the dogs, but we'll overlook do they, that. Do they care? Do they really care? Do the no. dogs care? I don't think they do. No. Anyway, um, we okay. are the Future of Photography. Join us on our Discord. Um, check out our YouTube channel if you want to watch the videos. Uh, see our photos. There's links in the show notes to all of this. And, of course, you can find all the episodes at thefutureofphotography.com. And... Uh, yeah, we'd be happy to talk to you on our Discord. I think that's that's um, it for this week. And uh, yeah, get the calendar or something to feed your <laughs> VR headset and uh, or a new pair of shoes, possibly. But don't subscribe <laughs> to, Not a, <laughs> to, a, to an ND filter. All right. Um, everyone, take care and we'll be back soon. Until then, bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Join the discussion on our Discord, find the show notes and all episodes at thefutureofphotography.com and subscribe wherever you listen to audio. 